our session on research networking in the Mediterranean region. Um, we are going to have uh, uh, two speakers. Uh, Mr. Stilianu from uh, Cyprus and uh, Mr. Fabianek from uh, the Commission. Uh, in the program, there was uh, also another speaker uh, scheduled, uh, Mr. Talazi from Palestine. Um, but uh, maybe some one of you had the chance to attend the session uh, uh, 4B uh, that uh, where uh, Mr. Tarazi has spoken uh, and um, because uh, there was uh, uh, some urgency for him to, to return to Palestine and then uh, he had to anticipate his uh, speech and uh, so you will be able to find uh, uh, information if you are interested about uh, this uh, presentation in the, in the CD-ROM uh, containing all the uh, presentations and uh, uh, the subject was international cooperation in uh, information technology in the Middle East obstacles and opportunities. Um, if we have uh, uh, the chance and if you are interested, uh, I think that uh, one uh, discussion that we could have uh, this morning is uh, concerning uh, obstacles and opportunities for the cooperation of uh, uh, Europe, let's say, with all the uh, Eastern and South Mediterranean countries. Uh, I have to say that uh, I find that uh, there are uh, difficulties in involving these people in, uh, in real cooperation. For example, also in the frame of Terena. Um, and uh, mm, so we, we should try to figure out. Uh, uh, which kind of initiative could uh, improve this uh, cooperation. Uh, also, uh, if we look at the attendance of this conference, uh, uh, which is uh, in the eastern part of the Mediterranean, we look that uh, we don't have uh, participants uh, from Jordan, from Syria, from Lebanon, from uh, Maybe someone from Egypt uh, is here, but um, uh, evidently there was not the, the wish to keep the chance of having uh, such an important event in this area to, to, to have uh, and to promote more participation. So there is something that we should do. And um, so let me now uh, introduce our first speaker, Agatoclis Stiliano. Uh, we have uh, quite a number of activities uh, in common with Agatoclis uh, because he is a uh, uh, member of the Terena Executive Committee and uh, he is uh, managing the country code uh, of Cyprus uh, as well as I'm involved in the country code dot .it uh, Originally he did different things of course and he studied with the uh, Brunel University in London where he got uh, his uh, bachelor and uh, PhD in computer science and uh, he is the director of Cyprus uh, Academic and Research Network. Okay, please, I'm going to please. Okay, thank you, Stefan. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Like Stefan has mentioned in his introduction, the major issue we have to address in the Mediterranean area is one of cooperation and collaboration. And in order to achieve that, we need to bring the people, the cultures, the countries talking to each other. You cannot achieve cooperation if you do not have communication. 
So this initiative, EIP initiative in the Mediterranean, interconnecting the Mediterranean, is aimed at bringing the cultures and the people talking to each other. Uh, I initially wanted my presentation not to be a presentation, to be a discussion, because what you're about to hear from me are things that we have mentioned many times before. And I was hopeful that there would have been quite a few representatives from the interested member countries and initiate a discussion and get the ball rolling and get this project, which we all seem to want very much, but for reasons that uh, are beyond my comprehension, we find difficulty in implementing. So let me, or in, not, not quickly, but I will touch on the issues that I wanted to send. I will have some time to discuss some of the issues that are really important. This is not really a new initiative. The um, European Union realized this a long time ago, back in 1995, when there was the Barcelona Euro Mediterranean Conference. They realized the importance for the development of the scientific and technological community in the Mediterranean region, and they realized that that had to go hand in hand with the upgrading and modernization of the local telecommunication infrastructure. And then this was followed up by the Euromagnet conference which was held in Cyprus, and there there was a definite proposal pointing towards the direction of creating the interconnection initiative. And after that we had the meta initiative which took upon it the conclusions from the Barcelona Euromagnet conference and the Cyprus Euromagnet conference, and they have realized that the cornerstone of the Metro initiative would have been the IP interconnection initiative. You cannot have projects between the various member states if you cannot have the means through which they can talk, communicate, collaborate. And that could only be achieved through establishing an IP interconnection environment for them. It, it, it's strange, but I have to say this from the very beginning. Mediterranean countries seem not to be able to talk to each other directly, but they seem to be able to talk to each other indirectly through another member state. And part of this initiative is to promote the direct communication between the member states. The conference recommendations of the Euro 98, just to outline a few, was that there was internet connectivity, it was a scarce resource in the Mediterranean region. It still is. But it's not a scarce necessity everywhere in the Mediterranean, it's more scarce in the non-EU countries. And that's where this recommendation was mainly aimed at. There was a recommendation that we should rapidly interconnect those countries, and, to, and the first step would be to interconnect research internet. And why was that? It's obvious, because researchers and academics like to think that they're not involved in politics, they're not influenced by politics, and their main interest is the promotion of academia and research and the well-being of the community which they serve. In order to achieve that, there was the need to create a regional backbone infrastructure and interconnect all 12 third Mediterranean countries of the region in between them and provide connectivity to the 10, 34, 155 and the now called giant network. At the same time, it should utilize and further develop the existing national network management and operation service centers and provide training and education to the national network management centers and promote exchange of know-how. There was no reason to rediscover the will. There was a lot of expertise within the region and we could all benefit by sharing that existing expertise. And the main aim would have been to stop the brain drainage and we'll get back to that later on because that was really the main objective by stopping the brain drainage. It could achieve local research activity and at the same time extend their economic well-being and growth. One of the main aims of this proposal would be to promote the collaboration between the Mediterranean region and the EU on projects, and at the same time promote the collaboration between the various countries, what I have said earlier on. It's not sufficient to promote interconnectivity between the Mediterranean countries and the European Union. That's part of providing the solution. The main aim 
is to get those countries to talk to each other, to cooperate and collaborate and to talk to each other, establish links. We needed to take advantage of the cultural richness and heritage of the region and show to each other that that cultural heritage didn't come out of those wars, but it came out of cooperation and collaboration. And now we had the initiatives from the Mediterranean Union, from the European Union. Through eHumanities, there was the main initiative to interconnect the European research networks and the research networks of the Mediterranean partner countries. There is one big question. Are there Mediterranean research networks? Do they exist? That was and still is a question mark because in some countries, because of both the political situations, there is no clear identification of a research network in some countries. And there has been difficulty in identifying those. So the aim is identifying the needs within the country, helping bring up the recent academic network within that country, and then interconnecting that regional, that research network with the other research networks in the Mediterranean region. What are the challenges of doing that? Since it's a scarce resource, and if you look at the availability of telecommunication infrastructure in the Mediterranean region, you'll find out that there's tremendous capacity which is underutilized. And the reason is why it's underutilized. One of the main reasons is the monopolistic situation that exists within those regions. The other is the political situation that exists in some countries do not want to promote internet because they're feared of some black magic that they may come into their communities. And the other is the lack of courage. So the European Union wanted to lend a helping hand. And so I'm going to help you build up this research network. And once we do, I'm sure you will realize the benefits of doing that and you will be able to further extend it yourself. In addition to that, we had to face some technological challenges. The main one was whether there was the necessary know-how within the region. The answer is yes. The problem is that it doesn't stay there for long. It tends to keep moving northwards. So part of the aim was to keep that know-how within that region in order to enhance the technological infrastructure of that region. We needed to provide a resilient network. We needed to provide a research networking, not commodity networking. We needed to provide a flexible and scalable topology that would enable it to adapt and provide interconnection to all the units. It should be able to be robust enough. It should be able to allow the researchers over there to run the applications that the European Union wants to promote and the nature of that region wants to promote as well, like water management, earthquake management, and telemedicine, and issues like that. It should be easily accessible. There should be no discriminatory issues related to it. And I think there's no need to say that when we talk about recent networks, all those go without saying. If we start talking about discriminatory and research, it's, it's a contradictory term. So when I talk about research, I would like all these issues to be accepted as going without having to clarify them. In addition to the application environment that it should provide, it should also provide the means for doing research at the network level and provide network management and to show the issues identify the issues of sensitivity, privacy, and confidentiality. So the main issues would be to address the limited internet connectivity in the Mediterranean region, enable the fostering of relationships between the northern and the southern scientific communities. It should upgrade the environment in the Mediterranean partner countries and it should provide a platform for the cooperative pilot projects to be launched in the framework of the eu Strand Strength 2 initiative. And this will in effect provide long-term socioeconomic benefits both to the region and to the European Union. Why is that? 
Obviously, the region has a lot to offer to the European Union, just like the European Union has to offer to the, to the region. Sometimes when you have an idea, you give that idea to two different groups to work on it, rather than just one group and bring more people onto that same group to work on it. And the reason is simple. Two different groups can look at the same idea from a different perspective, and they can possibly come up with two different but challenging ideas. And that's the whole idea. We, don't, we do not want other researchers from the Mediterranean region to move into the European Union. We do not want other researchers from the European Union to come into San Italia and stay here forever. We want both parties to work in their regions from a different perspective, use their culture, their knowledge, and possibly by working independently and collaboratively at the same time, they can enhance research much better. The high speed interconnection of the Mediterranean MRNs will enhance the future development of the countries involved and benefit the population at large by promoting the advance of both pure and applied research, as well as improving facilities for higher education. The advanced network services offered by the new network will encourage the development and deployment of network multimedia applications that will permit new forms of working, teaching, and distributed collaboration between the Europe and the Mediterranean region. And this obviously will enhance more effective competition, what I was just mentioning, in the global research community. The development of this infrastructure is critical to the Mediterranean region. It's very important, and I cannot hide my disappointment for not seeing more representatives of the Mediterranean region here. The development of this kind of infrastructure will contribute to more rapid integration of the region towards the GIST, towards the global information society, by bringing the interaction that is so much required between industries, citizens, research communities, and government, and by creating the appropriate political and regulatory framework and the advances made will help areas such as medicine, environment, health, irrigation, and so on, and will make these countries be members, not just observers, of the forthcoming information society. The results of this initiative will be to provide an opportunity for the Euromednet research community to benefit both from information and know-how exchange in the area of new networking services. It would contribute to the development of the Euromed Information Society as well as the gradual introduction of the Med region to the global marketplace. It will allow the NRS to optimize their investment bandwidth and provide quality of service provision to their users for a more representative cost of the service they are getting. And the use of the new technologies will allow wider use of advanced multimedia applications and services. Obviously with 64K connections or 130K connections you cannot really run research with academic services. You can hardly run email services today. And it would enable and facilitate and accelerate the collaboration between the European Union on one hand, the Mediterranean region on the other, and within the Mediterranean countries themselves. It would promote and generate new research and development issues in the Mediterranean region. It will identify the areas more in need of addressing the Mediterranean region and it will address issues that relate to the social, cultural and economic cohesion of the region. It will enhance the evolution of networking at a uniform level and generate a common and unified set of services. It will be a way forward that will stop the distinction between the North and South divide, divide that we tend to see in Europe as well. conclusions of this. Despite all the problems, whether those are social, economic, political, and technical, it's well understood and acknowledged that the Euro Mediterranean region will benefit from rapidly implementing the IP interconnection. The benefits will not come from the IP interconnection on its own. The benefits will come from the ability of the region to talk among itself, among the various countries within the region, to talk with the advanced countries that are in this region from the European Union, will enable applications to be shared among the various countries, will enable the transfer of know-how between the various countries.
countries. The Yemenis project can be the catalyst for this. And of course it's needless to say that about everything else we wish peace to the region and we are hoping that this kind of a project will move into that direction. It will enable the collaboration, it will enable the communication between the countries. I am sorry I have been mentioning this word once too often, communication and collaboration. But that's the essence of it. If you cannot talk to each other, then you cannot solve your problems. And the way to talk to each other will be to interconnect. I have to give an example which is representative of the situation. We cannot have telephone communication from Cyprus to Turkey. We cannot have fax communication from Cyprus to Turkey and vis-a-vis. But we have email and IP interconnection from Cyprus to Turkey. I think that says it all. Thank you very much. So, uh, I want to make a comment uh, and ask uh, uh, Agatoklis uh, about the role of uh, that Cyprus can play in, in this uh, mm -hmm. arena or existing links and initiatives that, which is let's say your offer as, as a country in, in this frame mm -hmm. and Okay, um, we realize that you cannot have one regional network in the Mediterranean region because of the various issues that are involved. And it's not because of the research and academic communities, because of, the, of other political issues. Cyprus can play a role into this, in being neutral in some respects to some countries and not being neutral in other respects. And that's why we see Cyprus as being the hub of the Eastern Mediterranean region, of enabling countries that have disputes or issues that they cannot resolve among themselves, we provide the framework for which they can talk to each other. And we are part of the Mediterranean region, we talk the same language, we share the same interests, we understand their cultures in the same way as they understand our cultures. Physically, we have the ability to interconnect both Israel and Palestine and Syria and Turkey and Jordan to a hub in Cyprus and then through that to, the, uh, to any public presence in, uh, in the EU initiative. If, not, if that is not considered acceptable because of some issues, then there is another opportunity to have one regional network in the Eastern Mediterranean, another in the Central Mediterranean and another in the Western Mediterranean, whereby you have another pop presence in Greece and Turkey could go to the Greek pop, Egypt could go to the Greek pop, and then the other countries could go to the Cyprus pop, and then the uh, Morocco, Tunisia could either go to the Spanish or the French or the Italian point of presence. So there are many interesting ways which we have helped show to the people. There, there are many design and approaches that one can foresee. And Cyprus has played a significant role initially in bringing these various people together and that became evident in the Euromedian conference in Cyprus when we had all the member states, all the Mediterranean member states there and we were able to talk to them and uh, I would like to uh, bring again the meeting we had in Athens about two years ago which was a most constructive meeting all member states were representative there Cyprus had connections with Syria, Lebanon, uh, Jordan, Egypt and we had to bring them there Greece had connections with other member states, Italy had uh, connections with other member states, and we managed to bring all the member states there, talking to each other and agreeing and sorting out our differences. The key issue was that we managed to bring them there, and we were able to talk to each other. We can still do that, but we're a bit concerned with the grey horizon that is now surrounding EU medicine, and I'm very pleased that uh, Fabianic is here because I'm sure he wants to talk to me as much as I want to talk to him afterwards and obviously to any other interested uh, member states who are here. Questions for Agatoklis? Karel and then Eve. Probably without a microphone in this room. Uh, you talked a bit about the problems and you talked a lot about the objectives and 
benefits that they would bring. And I was sort of thinking, what does it take to achieve this, to, to, to actually do this plan? Does it just take a, a big pot of money, or is there more to it? And at your last slide you said, well, we want peace and prosperity, and for that people need to communicate, and for that they need networking. But in order to set up networking, you have to communicate with each other first. And maybe that's the bottleneck more than, than lack of money, what do you think? It's a combination of issues. It's both, I mean, the European Union realizes that 7 million euros is not sufficient to cover this initiative. And there's also the political issue which wasn't as strong as it used to be before. I don't think that the political issue is uh, so big, except in the region of the, um, the, the conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis, but among the rest of the region, I do not see any problems. We were able to sit down and talk to each other and find solutions, designing the Mediterranean network is no big deal. We were able to get the Cyprus Telecom Authority, the Greek Telecom Authority, and the Italian Telecom Authority talking to each other, coming to Cyprus. There was an initiative by the Italian and the Cyprus Telecom Authorities. Coming to Cyprus, identifying possible uh, design scenarios, and they were able to put down a couple of uh, design scenarios, both using terrestrial and satellite links. So the physical interconnectivity is no problem. Finding out ways of interconnecting among the Mediterranean uh, countries is no problem. The problem is not so much talking to uh, between the recent academic people, but getting those who make the decisions for the recent academic and uh, research people to see the light and the benefits for their community when letting this project go forward. Two years ago, we were able to bring in one room representatives from Tunisia, Morocco, Syria, Turkey, Cyprus, Greece, Italy, Israel, and Palestine. For the last four or five months, we were not able to do that. And there are many reasons. Some interested parties, they, they lost interest because of political issues and administrative issues. There are new parameters introduced that did not exist there. The way it was done before, it was done through the initiative of people. Two or three people, Enzo uh, from Italy, Stefanos from Greece, Theodorus from uh, Greece, Abi from uh, Israel, myself, and Andres, were sitting down, and within a couple of hours we were agreeing on possible scenarios and possible solutions and we were talking to the rest of the community and they were agreeing with us and we were moving forward. Today there is more to it. I was wondering thank you from a, a, a total perspective we are providing what we call on the North American continent commodity internet to quite a number of Mediterranean countries for example, uh, Egypt, Tunisia, Algeria, and they communicate with each other. You just said Cyprus communicates with Turkey right now in uh, email, so that could obviate to uh, a certain degree the urgency to have a regional hub in the Mediterranean, because there is a distinction between the academic research and the normal internet. So I think in the first phase, a lot of uh, universities will be relatively happy just with the commodity internet. Of course, to make the jump to really next generation research, one needs higher capacity, which means infrastructure, which does not exist most of the time. If it exists, it is so expensive, nobody can afford it. So I, I think there are some intermediate steps one can take. One approach that we are quite proud of is Jordan. Georgia doesn't have a national research network. And uh, what we did there was to uh, implement with the DVB, direct video broadcast, seven universities, 145 megabit up, and then multiple dumplings with packet identifiers to the multiple universities. So that's one way 
and in the other direction they, uh, they will use uh, lower capacity telephone access etc because of the asymmetrical nature of the internet so I, I would suggest to, to take an, an approach whereby a number of these countries could be connected by a satellite for example in, in a relatively low speed way instead of putting the emphasis on the next generation because of course everyone dreams 155 and let us say everyone dreams longas and wavelengths now which is a little bit difficult so I would suggest a more gradual approach for the Mediterranean basin especially to make sure that the southern shores are connected into the networks. Thank you. Theodore Karunas from uh, GRNet. I have been following this initiative uh, for the past five years uh, and let me tell you my conclusion why not many or not most of the interested, interested parts are not here. Uh, and the main reason, in my opinion, there are other reasons as well, uh, that, that because all through these years nothing's happening. This is the main reason. N there's no other reason. Uh, there are, of course, there are other reasons that contribute to this, or we can use them to explain what's happening, but this is not the main reason. The main reason is that we have been meeting for the past five years and nothing's happening. And I think the nature of the Internet by itself is escaping us. I mean, what's happening, internet, I mean, most of the countries we are talking to, they have some internet connectivity. Uh, we don't want any grand plans, uh, to, or my, my impression is that the countries of the region are not anymore uh, attracted by any grand plans that would be imposed upon them by any European superstructures. Uh, because they haven't, initially they believe this, they believe that coming through the European Union and so on, something will happen. But it has not happened for the past five years. We have been meeting continuously with most of the countries starting from 95 on, every year. And every year promising them that something will happen within next year. And nothing is happening. So, uh, the, what is my opinion now? Now we have to take a more relaxed approach, a more bilateral approach, not any grand schemes, uh, connect whoever is possible, don't try to look into is there a research network or anything. Universities are all over the place, they have connectivity, the killer application as we know, besides everything else what we are talking about is uh, access to information and messaging, that's email and web. These are the killer applications of the internet today, regardless of what we say about telemedicine and so on. These are of interest to researchers and not to the larger communities, the specific groups that are doing research, the, the additional high, let's say, high-end applications. So my approach is this, connect as many possible, as, uh, as many countries as possible, at the soonest possible, otherwise even this version of the initiative will become discredited itself pretty soon, because now we are, in a way, promising that something will happen soon, but we have been doing this for the past five years. At every meeting for the past five years, will uh, uh, European uh, Union representatives, other uh, representatives from the regional networks and so on, are promising to the audience that something will happen with the next uh, time frame, but nothing is happening. So, uh, let's take into account what's, uh, what's the situa situation now in the area. There's some internet connectivity provided by commercial initiatives, and this is in a way it's not sufficient, but satisfies some needs. If we want to, to be credible, we have to provide country by country something of a higher level, let's say in the area of two mega, terrestrial two megabits, because the quality difference will be to going from a satellite link to a terrestrial link. And the main reason for that is the monopolistic situation. Let's, there's nothing else. I mean, the, these links are so, so expensive that it's out of any range. I mean, a 2 megabit within the Mediterranean region costs as much at this time a lambda in Europe. So, it's, I mean, it's absurd, but this is the situation. So, uh, we are faced with, a, uh, let's say, a five uh, years uh, of meetings and nothing happening in this arena, in the academic research arena. Uh, and at the same time, we have the commercial 
version of the internet that offers some services in the region and we should not, this should not be discounted because when we started talking on, in 95 about 2 megabit links there were high, this was a high end solution but it's not anymore it's not anymore and uh, costs have not uh, gone down since then we're talking about the same costs in the mm -hmm. area mm -hmm. okay. yeah. thank you uh, you want to Yes. Uh, just a uh, final comment. I, I agree with both uh, speakers with both uh, with what they have said. Um, let me just say that what Tedros has said about this delay is critical and it's crucial. And yes, some countries have lost interest. And yes, commodity internet has played a significant role, but it's not sufficient. And yes, messaging is important because that's the just of what every one of us requires, but it's not sufficient to promote the Indian Medicine Meta Initiative for collaborative projects. So that will create the starting point, the kickstart, but it shouldn't stay at that uh, level. And at the same time, monopolistic situation can be good and can be bad. But if it's monopolistic without any influences from the uh, governments, but at the same time, if there's a political will within those governments, they can exert pressure on the monopolies within the country and they can provide realistic uh, options for interconnecting. And uh, a crucial factor is uh, that the last uh, statement by Federal is that the needs have increased but the prices have remained the same in the Mediterranean region, which is true. And whereas three years ago we were talking about two megabit connections, now that two megabit connection is not considered a sufficient option, but the money from the European Union, which was allocated five years ago, was seven million. It remains seven million. No? Oh, well, there's some good news coming, so I will stop here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me make uh, just a comment. Uh, uh, from the floor, there is a clear signal to the Commission, and <laughs> now we have the speak of Mr. Fabianic, and there will be appropriate timing. Um, also, we have to consider that perhaps uh, with uh, no support from the Commission, this cooperation will not spring up spontaneously, or at least it, it is uh, difficult. Uh, answering to uh, Karevich's um, question concerning what to do, uh, I have a suggestion coming from Marwan Tarazi, the other speaker, which is not here. And uh, he suggests strongly to invest in uh, human factor and to have uh, uh, training uh, and train the technicians to help uh, uh, countries in, in the uh, Eastern and South Mediterranean region to, uh, to train uh, good technicians and to enlarge the base of those uh, able to to run the infrastructure and the applications. And uh, I really think that uh, uh, either doing this uh, remotely or in on site, uh, this uh, should be uh, a very important activity to invest on the human factor. So uh, now, uh, uh, Bernard uh, Fabianek uh, is uh, with the uh, research networking unit of the Commission. He's uh, in the Commission uh, after five years. Uh, he's a physicist and uh, used to be the assistant to the director of Key Action 4 in the Commission. And uh, his, his present uh, interest are uh, uh, from one side uh, EU medicine, on the other side uh, high speed networking. Please spend that. Thank you, Stefano. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, maybe you remind me of the training question at the end that there are already some ongoing initiatives. This presentation I'm giving today on the Humanities Initiative, the Euro Mediterranean Information Society, is also partly prepared by my colleague Michel Bosco, who's working in the international unit and who's uh, overall in charge of the Humanities Initiative, while we in the research networking unit only deal with the interconnection bit of it. Well, I will start with the, again, like Akatokis has already presented the objectives of the Humanities 
uh, its partners, the funding involved, then uh, a short overview on the pilot projects uh, provided by Michel Bosco, also some uh, preliminary results of the evaluation, and then I spend the rest of the talk on the interconnection initiative, I think, which is the most interesting one today. Well, as Albert Opis has already said, it started all in 95 in Barcelona. Uh, took already four years to come to the Humanities Initiative, and well, so far I would say two thirds of the Humanities Initiative are fulfilled because the focal points have been launched, uh, the pilot project uh, evaluation has been done, and the uh, pilot projects, I think, contracts are to be signed in. Uh, some of this year and then they start working, so it's only the interconnection initiative that is still missing. And it's running uh, about 2003-2002. Well, we are aiming to, of course, uh, as already said before, uh, to accelerate the economic growth in the Euro-Mediterranean region to improve the quality of life and, of course, have further better cooperation between the North and the South and of course also this uh, cultural and uh, multilingual aspects and uh, we need to take into account that uh, the couple European cultural heritage comes out of the Mediterranean basin so we should have close links with our world regions I would even say well we also want to promote uh, public innovative uh, services through the pilot projects for example then increase the internet connectivity among the Mediterranean partners and also to the European counterparts and to have some electronic platforms for all kinds of different areas. The partners, uh, it's 12 of them uh, from the Mediterranean ring, uh, including Jordan, which is maybe not such a Mediterranean country. Uh, for the interconnection initiative, it's maybe interesting to know that Cyprus and Israel are already connected to the European backbone network and uh, they are also associated uh, states to the uh, research framework program of the European Union. Malta just has received the same status, so they are also eligible for funding out of a different pot because the Humanities Initiative is something else that is outside of the IST program, so I can only talk about the IST program. And we only got the task of sort of implementing the Humanities IP, the Connection Initiative, but it's not our money, so to speak. So this is the European Office uh, from the External Relations Director General that is dealing with these issues, and it's their money. Can I ask, uh, uh, what about the uh, countries like uh, Albania and, uh, let's say, Croatia? Are they incepted into some uh, plan, or...? Maybe our Greek colleagues can help us on that. There's uh, a Balkan net proposal ventilated, but so far the former Yugoslavian states are not eligible for funding under the IST program. Mm -hmm. not but not in those countries. But already, uh, at this moment, uh, uh, Bulgaria and Romania are indirectly connected to Zeans, and it, we are working on any uh, uh, Yugoslavia as well, has been connected in the past two months, within the framework of this initiative. Yet another body to deal with. <laughs> The funding uh, initially was seen uh, 45 million, uh, split into three lots. As I've said, the focal points, the national agencies are set up to help promoting uh, the Humanities Initiative in the 12 partner countries. Then uh, the pilot projects with five sectors, each of them uh, with 7 million uh, more or less of funding allocated to it, and the Interconnection Initiative. Currently, there are talks to top that 45 million by another 20 million. Uh, before the end of this year and uh, there should be another 7 million out of these 20 million for the interconnection initiative. So I think this is already good news and now uh, when I come to the interconnection initiative I outline how we can spend this 2 times 7. The pilot projects, uh, as I said, there are five different application sectors, education, healthcare, cultural and uh, tourism, industry and innovation and electronic commerce 
where people seem to have a little bit of problems with the electronic commerce terms when it comes to uh, the interconnection issue because that's purely for research but uh, we don't see a big problem on that because the evaluation has showed that uh, about 167 proposals were received uh, from a thousand organizations across the Mediterranean area and 25 of these have been found worth funding so far and there are not so many in the electronic commerce area while there are much more successful ones in the education area which fits much better for the interconnection initiative too and also the participation in these uh, successful 25 ones is well across the whole Mediterranean so there's also no problem that somebody might feel to be excluded or not so well represented in there but as I said these are preliminary results because uh, the evaluation it's not completed uh, completely yet, the few odds and ends that have to be still to be resolved, but these 25 are already known and I think we'll go ahead with uh, contracting at least 16 of them and the topping up of the 20 millions I talked before is also to fund the missing nine and a few more maybe. Is the requirement that each of these projects involves more than one country from the region or some of the projects just for one country? It was an evaluation criteria that said there should be a maximum uh, number or uh, the maximum possible number of Mediterranean partners in the project. So I would say if there's only one Mediterranean partner, it certainly will have failed. I think usually there are nine or even more in it. So the interconnection initiative, uh, as Abitopoulos has already said, uh, it's the interconnection between the European Research Network platform, which is shown at the time being, and uh, the research networks of the Mediterranean partners, but also among the Mediterranean partners themselves. We want to create this infrastructure that is also serving the internet uh, communication needs, but also the needs of the pilot projects. And uh, it should also help to develop the internet in the different Mediterranean partner countries. The role of the Commission, of course, is uh, to fund this, but uh, not because we have plenty of money and want to spend it somehow. It's because we have already invested heavily in Europe in research networking over the past 15 years, and uh, it's also a mandate uh, of the Barcelona Dialogue and in the, actually in the context of Gion to go beyond Europe to interconnect with other regions, and uh, that's why we think it's worthwhile doing it, and that's why we got involved from the research networking unit. The aim is to establish a multi-megabit uh, network infrastructure for research and education and of course from the European side we also want to make sure that the funds are sound and efficiently uh, managed because still it's uh, taxpayers' money. The role of the partners in the Mediterranean, uh, we created the term of National Research Network Centers. These are sort of uh, the experts, the organizations that run the research network in the particular Mediterranean partner country and we also have the expertise on what is needed for their country so it's not something that the commission says here's a pot of money uh, we hire some kind of consultant that says this is the best network for the Mediterranean and we just drop it on top of them and say please use it it's something that we want to go together with them to come to a good solution that fits all of them so the role of these partners is because they have the knowledge to advise the Commission on what's best to do and also to be then later on uh, responsible for drawing up the requirements and implementing this network and then provide a service for the research community by helping them to access this new infrastructure. And uh, the second thing uh, is of course to provide this infrastructure to the partners. As I said, these uh, National Research Network centers will perform a detailed uh, study on uh, what is actually necessary to connect them, where the point of presence should be, uh, what uh, means fit them better, either it's a satellite-based solution or some kind of terrestrial thing. And we will also be responsible for the implementation of the uh, infrastructure. Also, these recommendations from their side will be the basis for an open call for tender for the infrastructure and then everybody is welcome to reply to the center. The role of the telecom operators is of course to provide the infrastructure and uh, because there is a mostly competitive uh, 
telecom environment in the area. We want to go, or we have to go actually from the mandate of the UMADIS uh, technical and administrative provisions, which are sort of the uh, ground rules uh, we have to follow, that there is an open call for tender for the infrastructure. And of course, the telecom operators can uh, benefit from, as you have said, the training aspects or so by setting up this infrastructure, which certainly will be an advanced infrastructure and learning on how to operate and maintain it. The funding, uh, here the figures are still for the initial 7 million. The Commission is not paying everything, we only pay up to 80% of the total cost, so it's uh, 7 million plus another 20% to make uh, 9 point something. And uh, we finance collectively, it's not that we finance 80% of something and maybe a little bit of training is financed uh, by the Mediterranean partners, it's everything is shared equally. Uh, we finance the planning, the procurement, uh, and the management of, uh, of the network. And of course it must uh, comply with EC regulations for the management of funds. Again, repeating what has been said before, we want to help uh, to boost the Mediterranean area in all kinds of different aspects. And uh, of course we would like to connect all 12 partner countries uh, if possible, but uh, so far we have also received already a letter from Jordan saying, uh, sorry, this is interesting, but uh, currently uh, it's not uh, very high up in our priority list. And also we take into account that Cyprus and Israel are already connected to GR, and uh, we don't know yet uh, the situation in Malta. They certainly seek also a direct interconnection with Xi'an because we have a digital map of funding through the ISD program, and Xi'an is a project in the ISD program. Yes, we also see that uh, this network is not a static one that's sort of built today and stays there for the next 10 years. Uh, it should be reviewed periodically so that people uh, say, well, here's a traffic search and we try to accommodate it by some kind of midterm review and then upgrade the infrastructure after one and a half or maybe two years. We would like certainly to increase the collaboration between the Mediterranean uh, researchers and uh, the researchers in Europe. Uh, like now the parallel grid workshop or so there are new initiatives ongoing that the Mediterranean partners certainly have a lot of interest to participate in these and a good research network infrastructure is just the basis to do that. And of course we have to have common acceptable use policies for all of them so that also excludes any uh, commercial traffic. We want to have uh, enough capacity to su uh, support the pilot projects and to support uh, the usual internet traffic and maybe some, some kind of grid or distributed computed application. Well, the network should be not just some kind of experimental one, it should be a stable and production quality network. We have foreseen to have one point of presence per country but maybe in uh, some particular cases, two points of press might be more convenient. We'll have to see how we then actually implement it, but uh, we have set up an advisory group that uh, can tell us what is really needed on a per country basis and where this point of presence should be. And with this information also we have developed a questionnaire which is completed by most of the partner countries, so we know actually already now the needs in the different uh, research networks in the Mediterranean and uh, this can be already a basis for uh, launching some kind of pre-tenders. Oh yeah, and of course the network is not just uh, to go into the point of presence, then the National Research Network Center should make sure that this is connected further on to the national network. And there we would also see to have some kind of traffic measurements to find out if there's, uh, how much is the inter-Mediterranean uh, network flow and also the intra-Mediterranean network flow. The timetable set up so far is that we had uh, two two-day meetings uh, at the beginning of this year in spring. Uh, where the first meeting we were able to get uh, 10 out of the 12 partner countries. In the second one it dropped down to 7 and now we have to see how many stay for the meeting in Athens. But uh, I would say these ones who stay are the ones that are really willing to be in this first phase and those in the first wave of uh, countries to be interconnected. It's foreseen to have in mid of June this meeting in Athens where we will launch the first phase because there's now several stages foreseen and phases 
of the initiative and uh, in this one we sort of finance uh, a few meetings uh, and also the work that needs to be done to launch a pretender which is then the basis for further negotiations with the partner countries to say the pretender has come up with two, three possible network infrastructure scenarios and it's up then to the partners to decide which one would fit best their needs. And we think that this could be uh, completed in autumn this year and based on the pretender, a second contract will be awarded to this group of, uh, uh, of uh, well, people who submit the proposal and uh, we then run the real tender for the infrastructure and provide it to the Mediterranean partner countries which should then be by the end of this year. So I hope there's something concrete and something is moving and uh, we keep uh, up to our own promises. This is now the last slide going a little bit beyond uh, the Humanis initiative. It's just showing what we in the research network unit are dealing with in terms of international connectivity. Of course there's the Humanis area which is so to speak also the blueprint or the test case for a third initiative to the American Latin countries which is then called ALIS America Latin Information Society which we will try to tackle uh, from next year onward. Then there's a special case with Turkey uh, because uh, Turkey is a candidate member state to the European Union and there are special funds available for that and we see how we can use them for special connectivity. We also have already a link uh, to Russia and Japan uh, the Korean, the Trans-Euro-Asian Interconnection Initiative uh, is also ongoing with the first link starting from France this year and we'll see how we can top this up uh, later next year. There's a request from Australia to connect through Singapore. The only question is how do we get to Singapore? Uh, also request to connect to Central Africa so maybe there would be a satellite-based solution quite helpful. And of course uh, all the transatlantic issues uh, where there are discussions now to from the Xi'an side to have a pure research link from 2.5 gigabit and also to have this European distributed access point uh, extended to New York so that the sort of the transatlantic bit is part of the European core network. And currently we've got three proposals for a transatlantic grid test bed which will be evaluated in two weeks from now and we'll see what will come out of that. And there's another project with the Silk Highway that provides satellite capacity to the Caucasian and Central Asian countries and that also comes in through Germany into the Xiao network which is also being upgraded I think in the course of this year to about uh, more than 20 megabits I guess. Thank you very much and I think there will be more questions to answer. <laughs> and then move from one back yeah. and keep that. Questions, comments? My, my, my question is, uh, it's not clear to me if you are if you're willing to finance infrastructure developments there. Uh, one of the major problems I see in those countries is that there is no fiber, there is no satellite links, there is no radio antenna, there is nothing. The European Commission will, for example, finance uh, 50 kilometers of a fiber. And if that financing, if the answer is yes, then at the end of the project, the property of the fiber, what happens? No, I just switch on this one now. No, we only finance the link to one point of presence and some equipment at the point of presence, so maybe a router or some kind of uh, service, but that's it. But uh, it's uh, the task of the it's a task of these national research networks <laughs> to uh, make sure that this point of presence is connected to, a net, to their network and uh, like if I see here to Algeria they have already 20 megabit satellite capacity and they say they would need the same for a European link so they have the infrastructure in place it's just for us to get there and to pick it up Well, from the ones that have completed the questionnaire, I'm certain that they have it. From my personal experience, sorry, from my personal experience, the access to infrastructure, even if it's there, is one of the major problems. Why? You're talking to the... Because of the cost. 
because the very high cost I mean even in Italy I'm from Italy even in Italy if I could have easy access to dark fibers I would be able to perform ten times what I'm doing now but I can't well, so I think that time. in an underdeveloped country without any orphans for everyone it's such a scarce resource as fibers will be highly difficult to obtain but we're not buying fiber there yes this was my question I mean we're not buying infrastructure we're providing a telecom or communication service to them we're not buying infrastructure in Europe no not I, yet. What, I, what I was asking if you are willing to finance some infrastructure there which is like building roads for example no well servers if you consider and routers if you consider that infrastructure yes but not telecoms fiber Well, it's only seven minutes, or maybe 14. <laughs> yeah, probably we're not even allowed to operate it there. So. Yeah. Thank you. If you'll only first a comment, then a question. First comment, uh, in, in Africa, for example, we're also providing, uh, via satellite, obviously, uh, most of these connectivities and uh, interesting enough uh, it all started uh, when the Canadian Prime Minister visited Africa in the context of the Francophonie and uh, gave every of the Francophone countries in Africa a server to connect to the web now of course uh, then they had that box but they discovered nobody could afford connectivity to the outside world so that was one problem so uh, uh, with some funding and uh, scrapping money together, they started with the 64 kilobit links uh, two years ago. And uh, interesting enough, it's growing, and the number of these smaller countries like Ghana are up to 2 megabit after two years. So there is a certain growth. Now, the other problem is that if you look at in these countries, if you want a telephone connection, it takes a year, and uh, you have to pay bribes to, uh, to have the PTT. So uh, forget fiber there. So there is a problem of a local capillarity. So I, I, I think again, one has to walk because one, before one can run. That's one. Uh, second, my question would be from a more logistical nature. Would the uh, request for tender be issued by the commission itself? No. Or there will be some kind of organization that is applying to the uh, commission with the proposal and they will run the call for tender. But uh, there would not be a kind of a Mediterranean Dante equivalent for that, for that project. Well, that could In other be. words, someone has to manage that whole yeah. project. Such a similar entity will be there, yes. Okay. And that will uh, launch a public call, official journal and so on. So you will be certainly aware of that. Thank you. And also for the pre-tender information, sir. Well, even some of your other satellite provider colleagues have already talked to us about that, so <laughs> they are certainly aware of the initiative. I have a comment myself, then, Karen, and um, it's concerning the, the content, uh, I will be more precise. Um, of course, the infrastructure is important and contributing to the uh, strengthening of the what is already there is quite relevant, but uh, uh, of course it is very important to uh, to improve the, the use and, and to spread the use of the network, especially in, in, in our area. So looking at the applications that you mentioned here, uh, if you take for example telemedicine, um, it is something very important, I agree, but it, it is also something which uh, needs that uh, uh, doctors or hospitals in, in Italy or in France or wherever uh, on not only do this as a demonstration just to, uh, to say, okay, look, it, it is functioning, but uh, what is difficult to achieve is to have some support on a continuous base because 
it is not only the question of organizing this service of telemedicine, but then there is the, the, the need of establishing a real connection between the hospitals uh, from, from the two sides. And, and, and this I find that is mm, quite difficult to, to realize. Uh, apart from this uh, possibility of making demos or special cases. Uh, well, I think that uh, uh, it is very important to try to promote, uh, to build up contents. Uh, I make an example. Uh, one of the arguments is tourism. But uh, if you go in the web today, and then you look for uh, information, touristic information on Egypt, for example, you will find that the source of this information is uh, almost 100% in the United States. And uh, there is almost nothing which springs out locally and which is something that is the local affair uh, to the external world. What, what you normally find is uh, the information that uh, uh, some uh, companies for tourism who wants to promote the US people or German people to, to go to Egypt or Turkey, for example, they just uh, uh, prepare all this information. And the uh, uh, developing countries in particular, uh, they should be encouraged to, to uh, document the culture, history, information on the territory and also the, the offer that they may make of their products, let's say, instead of having all this information produced uh, outside. So this is a, an aspect that uh, I think should be strongly uh, encouraged. Yeah, but that's part of the pilot projects anyway, and uh, it's also again one of the evaluation criteria: the sustainability of the proposal. And uh, the size of the proposal is about uh, two million each, so I think if it should be quite uh, enough to have something stable put in place. Yes, I have uh, three details questions, and they were all about the last slide with the timetable, uh, actually. Um, yeah. uh, first three questions that you, you said that the Commission has appointed this uh, advisory group. Does that advisory group uh, have uh, as its members representatives of all these countries involved? We have identified people of all these countries, invited them, and as I said, uh, ten of them came. Uh, last time it was only seven, but they are the heads of their national research networks. I mean, you have one here <laughs> sitting amongst us. Uh, that was actually my, my, my second question. Do you understand why in the second meeting you had a, even less than in the first meeting? And, and which are the seven countries that you have still have left? Uh, the problem was the funding, because we didn't pay for the trips. So the people who uh, came paid it out of their own pockets. And I think that's quite a good sign that they're interested to cooperate and then get this initiative running. Uh, well, the problem is because the focal points have actually funds available to finance these trips to come to experts, uh, to come to uh, some kind of meetings. But it seems the focal points are located at other ministries and that would need shifting uh, money from one to another and so on. And uh, that seems to be too complicated. But, for example, Egypt could not attend the second meeting, but then said it will uh, attend the meeting in Athens. The people that came uh, in the second meeting were Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Centre Apologies was there in the first meeting, Malta, Cyprus, Israel, Turkey, was it already seven? I guess Jordan and Egypt uh, joined also in the first meeting. Okay. And Lebanon and Syria never attended. Mm -hmm. well, my, my last question or remark, maybe this is a nasty one, but Theodorus uh, explained that the big problem is that it's all taken so long and time schedules are slipping all the time, uh, etc. When I look at new time schedules, well, when we talked only a few months ago, I think that meeting that's now planned for June would have taken place before today, or it might have taken place uh, here, uh, actually, and, and also that 
that uh, tender that now stands for December when we talked a few months ago it was much earlier so <laughs> I see that the all the milestones are still slipping Shifting I up. have a feeling if, if uh, well, I have a look one month later the milestone has gone back two months um, that's why you <laughs> never get anywhere uh, so what guarantee do we have that, that well we're that quite that confident at the moment it's on somewhere and, and not just keep postponing we have uh, received letters of intent uh, by five of these uh, organizations committing themselves uh, to funding 20% uh, of the first phase. So this is a written commitment and I think uh, that's why we're quite confident that we can go ahead now. <laughs> that's what. <laughs> look one month later and, the, and then the, the future milestone is two months later there's something about Achilles and the tortoise in the, they were also in this part of the world I think and the, uh, you never catch up no in this case uh, I can really say that we're confident because we got uh, uh, we're in the process of getting the letter from uh, Morocco uh, Algeria Tunisia Malta Turkey uh, and I guess Cyprus we get two and uh, Israel so with these countries, I think we can get easily ahead. And we'll see uh, Egypt uh, show some interest, but they haven't uh, sent any information if they're going to provide the signed letter of intent. So there's a commitment from their side there. And we also have asked about this commitment. And we got it within two weeks, so I think that's uh, pretty good. And therefore, why I'm now confident that in essence we can show something. We're actually even dragging our commissioner to essence, including members of the European Parliament, so if this doesn't work, then I think the thing is really dead. Uh, I, I believe, uh, my, I'm really convinced of there's interest in, in all countries. Uh, one of the problems that I have seen is uh, find, finding the right persons in its country. Uh, this is the problem because uh, the, the issue with the ministry is that the ministers usually have an, an overall view and have a different line of priorities. Uh, once we get to the people that are really interested, meaning the uh, researchers, the universities themselves, and once they appoint those people and the funding in a way goes to the interested parties, then this start, starts to work. Uh, and my, uh, I'm really convinced once this gets ahead, uh, everything will fall in because uh, uh, the people are there, they are interested, the, the needs are there, uh, they, know, they know what they need and also uh, another critical issue is uh, regarding the infrastructure and the jump start. Uh, our experience is that it takes a few years, like two or three years to realize, to get the local telecom to realize that what we, the speeds that we are talking about because they are used in uh, voice telephony speeds and when they hear about 2 megabits and so on uh, they are very, really confused what, I mean they don't understand it, uh, it took us in Greece about 3 years to convince them to, uh, to, to have like uh, SKF1 and so on uh, so it would take us some, in some countries take, uh, there are other difficulties as well but it would take some time so it would, uh, to, to, to have higher speeds. Uh, so what, what I'm trying to say is this. Let's start with smaller speeds. It may not look logical now from a European perspective, but this is what is needed. Uh, they have some maturity time to go through, and then we can start talking for higher speeds. Once we have something in place, then it will upgrade itself, or, or find the momentum to upgrade. And another uh, thing that I want to, to stress is content. It was said before. Educational content, local educational content is very critical to, uh, to, give, uh, to promote uh, this idea of research networks. Because if we don't have local content, then uh, all uh, information uh, requests go as they go now to a great percentage in the area of 70 or 80 percent of the states. So th this uh, politically is very important to encourage initiatives that uh, produce local content, educational, uh, cultural, uh, what, what else. Thank you.
I think it's a for the Mediterranean countries, it was difficult to sort of understand this 20% co-financing uh, that they would need to come up front with it, uh, and uh, it needed some explanation from some kind of uh, you made it to how the financing actually will be run, and, and, and what is their involvement and how they need to contribute to. The other thing is these letters of intent to come back to Karel's first question that uh, it needs in some countries the foreign ministry to be involved uh, for signing that because it's a commitment and uh, about all this uh, current uh, political situation in the Mediterranean it's not that easy and that uh, sort of delayed us that we had to have a, a second advisory group meeting for example it's not possible to have a common consortium uh, some kind of steering committee or whatever in this initiative so we needed to find out our organizational structures and luckily we have found these and that's why we are confident that this can work now. Also from the side of the European Commission because we also want to make sure that our funds are spent as well. Uh, just a comment. Yeah, uh, just a comment to that. that. Actually what you have just mentioned is very important because the initial way we were working, we were working towards 100% support from the European Commission. And that meant that the researchers found it easy to come to the meetings, agree to the issues that really concern them, realizing that since my funding agency or my Ministry of Education or my Ministry of Foreign Affairs will not get involved in real terms, it would be easy for them to give their blessing onto this initiative. And that was a key factor. The fact that we have this 20% gain in funding, I will call it, it's creating tremendous problems. And I would suggest that the European Union thinks about that because if it follows something similar along the lines of 1034, and Jan, where it started out with high levels of funding and gradually limiting that, give it a kickstart, help it, give it 100% funding at its first phase, and then see what ha happens after that because it worked in other new areas before. Once we got a test of the street first, they found it difficult to let it go. That's why we are starting with this uh, first phase just to develop what he called the full proposal, but that's just uh, something more in detail and actually just as a proposal for the phase two because for the phase one we already have a one-page uh, draft summary which is good enough and, and it's also good enough for the pretender to be launched. But there they sort of see them in, uh, with this half a million that is offered in the phase one. Uh, they can finance their travel and they see an outcome which is the pretender, which is sort of the maximum capacity and also the maximum money they need to pay for the uh, phase two. And that's actually, as you say, uh, to get used to the procedures, to see how it works, what kind of uh, uh, contractual agreements they need to have in place and so on. Okay, uh, I uh, wanted to point out something about the lab or it was the national networks. Maybe it's worthwhile to try and push something with privatization because about 20 years ago in Israel, we had to wait a year or a few years for a phone line and we've got the situation where in less than a year we'll be able to buy dog fiber. So, and so recently there wasn't much telecommunication international competition also brought down the prices a lot and I just think with the monopoly, it just, it, it just won't happen. Even now, in remote areas, to get the ICDN line is very, prob is very problematic. And they do this for, tele for, the <coughs> for telemedicine, because anything over that is bundling a few lines. And it just doesn't work. You have to have somebody who can do these things. Yeah. Uh, actually, there are two parallel initiatives I didn't mention. One is from our colleague uh, in the deregulation uh, directorate in uh, Director General for the Information Society, which has actually an ongoing initiative for the Mediterranean area, and they actually pay projects, for example, in Nigeria, even several millions, on advising them on how to deregulate. And I think even uh, is it Morocco that quite took over all the uh, more or less this European regulation that the area and copied it, applied it to their own market. So there's an offer from the European Commission to help to assist in how to deregulate telecoms. And there's another uh, aspect that comes back to Stefano's question in the beginning uh, concerning uh, training uh, in this area. Uh, the Commission is also organized in the External Relations Director General that there's uh, somebody that looks after each country. And for example, for Syria, there's an uh, initiative become several millions of euros on uh, how advising their telecom operators uh, how to upgrade, modernize uh, the network. 
and uh, this includes also training. And uh, I had a visit from the local meta team there in Syria, and uh, we discussed even that some uh, people might come to uh, sit a few months with us and see and learn how the Commission and uh, structures work and so on. So these things are there. There are offers on the table. It's up for the Mediterranean partner countries to take them, I would say. I have a technical comment to what Caruno says before. He says we should start with lower speed and then upgrade. Well, the, the technical comment is that I am afraid to deploy a PDH infrastructure in those countries. I don't want PDH in these Nobody's countries. talking about PDH. So, what we are left is high speed modem, which are very cheap, but the basic infrastructure should be SDH, which oh, is certainly. A high speed, 155. Well, Algeria is asking for 60 megabits to start with. Morocco needs another 2 megabits at least to the current 4 megabits they have. Yeah, but what I Well, think Turkey has 45, so <laughs> they need something in the same order. Fine. So, actually, what we are talking is that the best thing looks that we are start with modems where they are any, nothing else than normal plain old telephone lines, but the core should start from SDH. Yes, certainly. Fine. <laughs> Nobody talks about modems. <laughs> it's uh, then uh, some question of what kind of satellite terminals or so we might use, and because there are different technologies of tracking satellites, would be cheaper but more expensive than the ground stations and so on. But uh, we're talking megabits, yes. Uh, you said previously that you are going to encourage uh, deregulation by means of uh, consulting uh, its country, if I understand well. Is it what you said before that you are fostering uh, the regulations in some countries by having consulting groups for its country? No. There's uh, another group in our director general, that's about well, this old director, is focused on European deregulation, and we have an international unit again. And they offer service, okay. saying they advise on what kind of steps they should take and implications. This is a legal story. Have you ever considered that a part of the infrastructure of uh, NRM could be? Uh, some part of, uh, like what Mario said before, dark fiber or something which is an asset for them. It's not kind of... Uh, uh the inner range usually in these countries don't own the infrastructure. They get it from the national operator. But there could be, you know, a momentum uh, change in, uh, in, the, in the place. Yeah. And that could be fostered by EU. That's if we would pay, the or pay the subsidies for its infrastructure. We'll have to see. I mean, it could be that it's, for example, cheaper to buy these 50 kilometers of fiber than leasing it from the incumbent operator, yes, if regulation uh, allowed. Yeah. But uh, in the countries we are talking with, uh, usually they are quite happy with the service from the operator, like in Morocco. All the international capacity goes through the state-controlled operator. There's no alternative to that. So probably we have to adhere to this. Also, sometimes you have quite complicated constellations of the research network uh, itself because there are some different layers of organizations dealing with different parts of research and so on. Okay. Other comments? So, uh, I would uh, like to emphasize that uh, you, Bernard, uh, can uh, understand that the expectations are high. high, and you should report this, although the attendance was not so uh, big, but uh, uh, apart from the expectations, uh, the major part about the expectation is also timing, because uh, uh, it's money, of course, and it, it is very important, but time because uh, it took too long to start all these activities and uh, perhaps uh, starting with uh, smaller objectives but starting very soon it is more important than implementing all the plan. Uh, this is the message that you can report. <laughs> I think we from the Commission side have already lowered quite our expectations and also the conditions we put uh, forward so I think we are going to our limits. <laughs> it's not up to other players in the field to uh, really back this initiative and then push it ahead. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, thank you all for your patience and attention.